Well, I have a question. How many of you love a great three-part sermon? It's great, isn't it? Do you love that? I mean, how many of you give them, right? How many of you love a good four-part sermon? Well, I figure if three or four-part sermons are good, then a 20-part sermon would be great, wouldn't it? I mean, what could be better than 20 parts? And so I'm going to give you a 20-part sermon, seriously, and I'm going to spend a little more time on the first few parts, so for clock watchers, just relax. But what I'm going to talk about is really important. And I, to set it up, let me just ask, how many of you like the, the, the cartoon strips and cartoons in the newspaper? Do you enjoy those? Uh, maybe I should ask a question before that. How many of you remember what a newspaper is? <laughs> okay. Well, they're paper, and they used to have these cartoons in them, and some of them were really funny. How many of you know what the best cartoon series ever was? We're going to have a, div- a division right here. We're creating new... Anyway, I'll tell you what it is. It's the far side. Yeah? yeah. yeah. Yes. And I want to show you, I want to start tonight with a far side comic that I always loved. It, 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 I think it gives us a poignant truth. <laughs> One thing about far side comics, sometimes you have to look at them a while. But just uh, for those that haven't quite caught it yet, or if you're hearing this by audio, it's two deer standing in the woods, as they do when humans aren't watching. And one has what looks suspiciously like a target on his chest, and the other one is saying, Bummer of a birthmark, Hal. (laughs) And I show this because I think it's funny and I enjoy it, but I, I have a serious reason, because that represents us. And more than that, it represents our kids and our grandkids, if you have grandkids. We have targets painted on us. You know, Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And he's a roaring lion seeking to devour again, especially our kids, the younger generations. And I I don't need to tell you, but I'm going to demonstrate it here in a second with a new slide, but... The culture's changed. And I I tried to show you that in a big visual last night, but I want to show it to you in a new way. I live in Colorado now. I lived in Illinois, then I lived in Southern California, now I live in Colorado. And uh, I live very near Colorado Springs. And a lot of people, maybe some of you thought that was a Christian city. You know, because that focus on the family must have taken over, you know, the city a long time ago. And you got the Navigators, you got Compassion International, you got all these great ministries. And if if there's ever a spiritual place, it's got to be Colorado Springs. So let me show you a billboard that went up in Colorado Springs just last year. And there were more of them just like it in Denver. And again, if you're hearing this on a audio, let me read what it says. God is an imaginary friend. Choose reality. It will be better for all of us. And then that's compliments of our friends, our friendly neighborhood Colorado Coalition of Reason, because of course they're the ones with reason. We just have religion, they have reason. At least that's the way they think. That's a picture of where our culture's heading. You go in the uh, religious sections of most mainstream bookstores, the Barnes and Nobles type bookstores, look in the religious section and you'll see books like The God Delusion by Richard Dawkins and The End of Faith by Sam Harris and God is Not Good by Christopher Hitchens with the subtitle How Religion Spoils Everything. And it goes on and on and on. And these are the... these. Authors and speakers are becoming leaders in the culture, and a lot of our young people know about them, read them, hear about them, get influenced by them. They have websites, they're very active bloggers, they get in the media, the media loves it, it's shocking, you know. Um, the, the internet has brought a proliferation of misinformation, uh, arguments and attacks on the Christian faith that were refuted decades ago. Well, they get resurrected and regurgitated into the internet, and a lot of our young people are reading those, and they don't know they were refuted. They don't know the answers. And so their, their faith is impacted. 
I want to show you another picture. Uh, this one's from London, England, where a bunch of the secularists there thought they would enlighten, enlighten the rest of the culture by letting them, know, letting them know. They put these signs on the sides of the buses. You know, you got these double-decker buses. I guess I don't know if that one is or not. But they got the big buses in London. So they bought a bunch of signs. These were all over London. They said, there's probably no God. Now stop worrying and enjoy your life. One in three Americans under 30 now describe their religion as, quote, atheist, agnostic, or nothing in particular. One in three under 30. This has doubled since 1990 to 15%. The nuns, the people that say nothing in particular. The percentage of atheists in America has increased fivefold in the last seven years. You know, there are now, we all, we all grew up knowing about InterVarsity and their chapters and Campus Crusade and their chapters on campuses. There are now secularist student organizations popping up on campuses all over the U.S. And last fall, Lee and I published something. We talked about how there were 250 of these now on U.S. campuses. And an atheist was quick to correct us. He said, no, there's 400 now. Secular, like, like, like the opposite of InterVarsity on campuses. And here's, here, just listen to this one. Young people are dropping out of church at five to six times the historic rate often because of intellectual doubts. <clears throat> we must address this. We have to show that Christianity is true. And we have to do our homework. We have to learn how to communicate these things. Now, we're not all going to become philosophers or professional apologists. But First Peter 3.15 says to all of us in the body of Christ, be prepared, get ready to give an answer to everyone who asks for the reason for the hope that you have. That's for all of us. And when it says answer, the Greek word there is apologia, which is the word for apologetics, the word we get that from. And it literally means be ready to give a speech of defense. And so part of it is the defense. I mentioned this last night, be ready to give an answer. The other part is ready to get on the offense and present truth. Uh, it's, as it says in 2 Corinthians 10.5, to be ready to demolish arguments and take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. What I want to do is get on the offense tonight. And I'm really going to click through 20 reasons we can be confident Christianity is true. Now, I'm sure most of you are quite confident already. But we need reasons. So many, I think one of the reasons, one of the, perhaps the main reason, so many young people go, to, go away to college and lose their faith is because we've done a really good job of teaching them what to believe and a really poor job of teaching them why it's true. So what I want to do tonight is kind of give you truth through a fire hose. And really, we're, I'm, I'm going to go fast through a lot of stuff. So I know it's been a long day, but perk up. I'd encourage you to take some notes because uh, we're going to go through these. I'm going to start with science. And so this, it, for a lot of us, these first few arguments are going to be the most new and foreign, but I think exciting. Do you realize that in the last few decades, we, our case has gotten stronger and stronger? It's so ironic. While young people are dropping out, and while the culture is more and more acting like, you know, we're the ones with religion and they have reason. The arguments, the evidence from science, especially, and even in philosophy and, and discoveries in history and archaeology, it's getting stronger and stronger. So it's time for us to gear up and to do the work, it says in 1 Peter 3.15, to get ready, get prepared, and more than that, to be ready to share that with the people around us. So it's in kind of that 2 Timothy 2.2 2 spirit. I want to share this. That I would spread it to you so you can spread it to other people. And what I'm going to share is out of the book Choosing Your Faith. And I give all of this in more detail there. But uh, let's click through this. And I'm going to dive right in to argument number one. And we're starting with science. <clears throat> and by the way, I'm going to kind of dual task before I get to that argument. Um, with each of these, I call these 20 arrows of truth. You see it says reason one, you see the arrow? I'm going to draw a diagram on the chart here that I hope most of you can see. Um, and it, it kind of forms a pattern, and you'll see, and I'll apply this at the end. But reason number one, here's an arrow, and it says design in the universe points to an intelligent designer. 
And, and let me say one more thing in, by, in preliminary before I start. My 20 reasons are not Bible verses I'm going to quote to you. I, I, I believe the Bible is inerrant, God's inspired word. The problem is we're reaching a culture that doesn't share that view. So I think we should show them what the Bible says, but the kinds of arguments I'm showing here are designed to reinforce the confidence in the Bible itself, reinforce confidence that what the church teaches is true, that God exists, that Jesus is who he claimed to be, and so on. So just so you understand, that's why the first one isn't one verse, the next one another verse. This, I'm, I'm trying to show secular people and kids of our, from our churches that go away to secular schools or get out in the culture show them that we have reasons, in addition to Bible verses, that we can be confident it's true. Design in the universe points to an intelligent designer. <clears throat> now this argument has gotten stronger and stronger. Um, its most famous uh, proponent was in 1802, however. William Paley wrote a book called Natural Theology. And he's the guy that made famous the illustration that if you're walking along and you see a watch on the ground... You know something about that. You don't look at that watch and say, praise the cosmos. You know, look what, look what time plus chance has produced. What an interesting fluke. You don't do that. You pick it up and you say, there's design here. There's clearly intelligence behind this. And the phrase, here's the kind of way we need to start thinking. Wherever you have design, there has to be a designer. Wherever you have a watch, there has to be a watch maker. Okay? So that's a good argument. But I'm telling you what, Paley would have salivated to know more of what we have today. Let me just give you one example. You, you look at your own wristwatch, if you have one on. <clears throat> that requires a wristwatch maker. That has design. But look from the watch down to your wrist. Do you know your wrist has far greater design than that watch does? So if the watch needs a watchmaker, then the wrist needs a wrist maker. Right? Now, more than that, get a microscope out and look at your... Not right now, okay? I, mean, I don't want to cause a disruption. Later, get the microscope out and look at your wrist and magnify it down to the point where you get to the level of the cell, where you're looking at the cell in your wrist or any cell in your body. And I want to give you a description from a non-Christian scientist named Dr. Michael Denton, in a, actually an Australian molecular biologist. Here's a description of one cell in your wrist or anywhere else in your body. He says, To grasp the reality of life as it has been revealed by molecular biology, we must magnify a cell a thousand million times until it is 20 kilometers in diameter. That's about, I think, 15 miles. And resembles a giant airship large enough to cover a great city like London or New York. What we would then see would be an object of unparalleled complexity and adaptive design. On the surface of the cell, we would see millions of openings, like the portholes of a vast spaceship, opening and closing to allow a continual stream of materials to flow in and out. If we were to enter one of these openings, we would find ourselves in a world of supreme technology and bewildering complexity. See, back in the days of Darwin, a cell was a blob of life. They didn't have good microscopes. This is what we know now. And then Dr. Denton says this. He asks a really good question. He says, is it really credible that random processes could have constructed a reality that is complex beyond our own creative capacities? A reality which is the very antithesis of chance? which excels in every sense anything ever produced by the intelligence of man. I mean, does that really happen by chance? He's saying, you look at that cell and you discover it is more complex than the space shuttle. And you say, oh, that just happened. Really? You say that, you have more faith than I do. So, arrow one. And by the way, this alone has changed people's minds. Oh, and by the way, too, this is biblical. Psalm 19.1, David said, The heavens declare the glory of God. And by the way, turn the microscope around, look out at the telescope, look at the order in the universe, and you may discover what Robert Jastrow, a non-believing scientist who was part of the, um, the space center you know, out in Pasadena, he, through the order in the universe, 
he said there must be a God. And he ended up writing a, an excellent book called God and the Astronomers. So again, I could go on and on with this, but that first argument is powerful. Let's go to the second one, which is a cousin to the first. It's sort of the first one on steroids. It, it, it takes it further. And this is where I think William Paley would have really salivated to see what we have today. Reason two <clears throat> says that fine-tuning in the universe points to an intelligent fine-tuner. I know this is new language for some of us, but what we're talking about here is that there isn't just order in the universe. There is precision in the way a number of factors have been set exactly where they had to be so that life could be supported in our universe. And there's about 50 of these. And what, what I want you to picture is like 50 big dials up here in the sky. And everyone has to be set to a microscopically precise setting. And if, it, if you bump it with your elbow, we freeze. Or if you bump it the other way, we, we're toast. And that's just one of them. I mean, there's like 50 of these that science has discovered. And this is mostly in the last 40 or 50 years. Science is increasingly our ally. So you have about 40 or 50 of these. They have to be exactly right. And I want to just give you one example, just one of these dials up here that we're looking at. And Lee Strobel, in his book, The Case for a Creator, an excellent book on science and how it supports Christianity, interviewed a, a man named Robin Collins who specializes in these things. And he said, give me one example. And Robin Collins said, okay, let's talk about the cosmological constant. That's a description of one of these dials. Uh, it, it, what it is is the energy density of empty space, which I'm sure you were probably talking about this morning over coffee. <clears throat> he says, well, there's really no way we can comprehend the precision of what we're talking about. He says, the fine-tuning has conservatively been estimated to be at least one part in a hundred million, billion, 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 billion. That's a 10 followed by 53 zeros. That's inconceivably precise, he says. He says, let's say, now he gives an example, what that, uh, the odds of it being that finely tuned are, are the same as, here's the example, if you were in outer space and you have one dart, and from outer space you're going to throw the dart at a target on earth, not the deer, a target, he says, that's one trillionth of a trillionth of an inch in diameter, which is less than the size of one solitary atom. So you ready? You're out in outer space. You know, you, you open the hatch in the spaceship, got that dart. Good luck. You got to hit a target on Earth less than the size of an atom. And if you do, you've just matched the precision of one of those 50 dials. Now, now let's look at the other 49. You know, the odds of this happening by chance, by comparison, Lee Strobel says, by comparison, it makes the lottery look like a sure bet. <laughs> it's a pretty good description, isn't it? It's so precise, and, and when you really get this whole picture, that one, again, non-Christian physicist, Fred Hoyle, summed it up by saying, it's almost like someone was monkeying with the physics. To which we say, where there's monkeying with physics, there's got to be a monkeyer. <clears throat> so, that's our second arrow. Let me go on to our third. Information encoded into DNA indicates that there is a divine encoder. Now this one, this, I had to study up on this one a little bit, and I'm aware some of you may be experts on this, but humor me with this, because I'm going to give you a layman's kind of description. But there's information, in, let's just go back to the cell you were looking at a minute ago through the microscope, you know, in your wrist. One of those cells, or any cell in your body, has DNA that contains information. And it, it contains the instructions that make your body work and function and all those openings in the cells to open and close and everything to move the way it's supposed to. It's an amazing set of instructions. Now, I want to give you a description from a, someone who is an expert on this. Before I do it, I want to talk about information for a minute. Remember when we were walking along a minute ago and we found that watch? Well, we were on a beach. And let's say we keep walking down the beach 
And we come along and we see some nice patterns in the sand where apparently overnight, it's early morning, the waves apparently made this beautiful pattern. Well, that's a pattern. You don't have to, you know, ascribe any kind of real intelligence to a pattern. It's just something that nature does. But then you walk a little further and you kind of say, we're over here now. And we come along and we see a heart shape in the sand with an arrow going through it. And then you look and it says inside the heart, it says, John loves Mary. Now you say, you know, you, what, what you don't say is, wow, the waves were really creative last night. <clears throat> no. You say, there must be an intelligence behind this. Maybe not a lot of intelligence. Uh, maybe mostly some wishful thinking, but there was, there was some kind of mind behind that message, right? That be, why? As simple as that is, that's information. There was a movie, Contact, years ago. We talked about the SETI telescopes, and they're looking for one simple pattern from outer space. And if they get this simple pattern, then they know there must be intelligence out there. Just something simple. So keep that in mind, the simple pattern in the contact movie, or let's just talk about the heart, you know, John loves Mary. If that requires an informer, let's compare that for a minute to the information in DNA. You're probably aware the Human Genome Project spent years and years and years and bazillions of dollars mapping out the human genetic code, the human genome. And they did this, they completed it, and the guy in charge of it was a guy named Francis Collins. And later he did a press conference with President Clinton, and Clinton used some interesting language. He said, we've now discovered the language with which God created. And later Collins wrote a book called The Language of God. He's a Christian, by the way. And here's what he says. He describes that information in every cell of every one of our bodies. Here's a description. Follow this. He says, the, this newly revealed text, interesting he calls it a text, was three billion letters long. What's our alphabet? 27 letters? Three billion letters long and written in a strange and cryptographic four-letter code. Such is the amazing complexity of the information carried within each cell of the human body that a live reading of that code at a rate of three letters per second would take 31 years even if you read day and night. Just read the information in one of your cells. It's going to take you 31 years. That's if you don't take a potty break. And then I love this. He says, if you print these letters out on regular font size, so I guess it's 12-point font, on regular computer paper and bind it together. He tells us how high the stack would be of information in one of your cells. You know how high it would be? Not this, not that. The height of the Washington Monument. Which sounded impressive, but it was more impressive when I looked up to find out how high that is. It's 555 feet high. So what is that? Roughly 55 stories high of paper with the information in one cell in your wrist? Now I ask you, if John Loves Mary requires an intelligence, what about a three billion letter long alphabet with a four part binary cryptographic code that printed out is 55 stories high? What kind of an intelligence does that require? And, and it, you know, again, when someone says, oh yeah, but that, it all kind of just happened on its own. It's like, I may not say this to them, but I'll say it to you. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Now again, we've got to be careful how we talk to the people with, with the, you know, got to ease our way, be respectful. The rest of that verse I quoted earlier, give an answer, do it with gentleness and respect. But I'll tell you, what a blind leap of faith to see that tower of information and then say, I think it just kind of happened. Really? That's a blind leap of faith, and I I would rather trust in reason at that point. Okay, go on to number four. This is our last scientific one, in case you're into other things. Um, But this one's another really important one. This is a good one. The beginning of the universe shows a divine beginner or divine originator. Now, the argument, the way it's usually stated, is this. It's called the cosmological argument. Whatever has a beginning has a cause. 
Science is based on that whole idea. It looks at effects and gets to the cause behind them. Einstein said the scientific mind is seized by a sense of universal causation. So whatever has a beginning has a cause. That's not very controversial. Second statement, the universe had a beginning. And we know this as Christians, but physics, physicists have agreed, I mean, it's almost universal, that some shape or form, there was an explosion called the Big Bang some time ago. The, and at the beginning of that explosion, they, they describe it, it was everything in the universe. I mean, all the stars, all the planets, everything was down to one infinitesimal point and in one grand explosion, in one fraction of a nanosecond, boom, there was the universe. And they say, yeah, that happened. That's a scientific fact. And I say, I think you're right. It happened, and I think science is doing its best to describe it. But we have another word for that. We call it a miracle. In fact, we have a, 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 a statement in theology that says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth ex nihilo, out of nothing. That's exactly what they're saying. Really, when you, you study what they're saying, this infinitesimal point isn't even physical. It's just, it's, it's, it's this belief they have. And by the way, atheists believe this. Secular scientists believe the Big Bang. Uh, Stephen Hawking, for example, his most recent book, The Grand Design, all about this whole thing. And then you ask, how did it happen? He goes, well, I think there was gravity, therefore it had to self-create. It's like, Really? I mean, he's so smart in other areas. I mean, here's what it points to. Whatever has a beginning has a cause. The universe had a beginning. Therefore, the universe has a cause, and that cause can't be part of the universe. It's outside the universe. And here's the way I would describe it. And this is coming from philosophy and science. It has to be outside of time. It has to be eternal, because time came into existence at the Big Bang. So therefore, we would call this power, we'd call it eternal. It can't be physical because it's not part of the physical universe. Therefore, it's something else. Maybe call it spiritual. Uh, it has to be powerful enough to evoke this kind of a bang, right? This kind of, this universe. That's great power. I would probably describe it as omnipotence. It has to be smart enough to not only make it all come together right, but then to dial these 50 dials in perfectly so life can be supported, I call that omniscience. And I, I think it took love to, to do that in a way that could support our lives. Omnibenevolence. And I think creative and artistic, and we can go on and on. This is a scientific and philosophical description of the God we worship. Science and theology come together. In fact, if I can find it quickly, Robert Jastro, the guy that wrote... <clears throat> They wrote, God and the Astronomers, had a quote. It's, it's a famous quote you've probably heard before, but uh, let me see if I can get to it quickly. Yeah, this is so good. Again, this guy isn't even a Christian. He says, for the scientist who has lived by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a, ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He is about to conquer the highest peak as he pulls himself up over the final rock, he is greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries. <laughs> Isn't that good? Science is pointing the same direction good theology points. And one more thing. Now, some of you may be going, this sounds a little heady. And, you know, the people I talk to don't think this way. By the way, secular people do. Many. These, these arguments work. And I have a friend that Lee Strobel told you about last year, if you were here. If you remember, he told you the story of the big debate he and I hosted at Willow Creek many years ago between William Lane Craig and an atheist. I mentioned it at the lunch if you were there today. And it was a blowout. I mean, we had 8,000 people there. And it, it just, I mean, overwhelmingly, the people voted that the Christian side won. And 47 people became Christians that night. And William Lane Craig debates all over the world. And he's been doing it now for like 30 years. And one of his chief arguments is the one we just talked about. And I'm telling you, the leading minds in the secular world don't have a clue how to answer. I mean, they take cracks at it. But they don't know how to... There's whole websites on how to debate him by secular people. Here's how you try to... Good luck with it, but you know, here's... 
This is a powerful argument. And he, he goes all over the world. He's taken on most of the world's leading atheists. But there's one that refuses to debate him. And that's Richard Dawkins. The guy who's probably the most famous atheist in the world. The guy that wrote The God Delusion. The guy who scoffs at religion. The guy who spoke at the Reason Rally last year and told all of his atheist buddies to start ridiculing religious people because we deserve it. In fact, he once said, if you believe in God, you may be mentally ill. This guy, who's so bold and cocky, refuses to debate William Lane Craig. So the Christians were bringing Craig to the UK a year ago, October. <clears throat> and, uh, yeah, October of, of 2011. And they thought, let's take another crack at it. Excuse me, I just caught a cold. So they said... Let's take another crack at it. Let's see if we can line up Dawkins and finally have the clash of the titans here and do a real debate at Oxford. They booked the theater, Sheldonian Theater, at Oxford. They lined up the date. They went for uh, Dawkins, and he refused again. By the way, there is a website that keeps track of all the contradictory reasons that Dawkins refuses to debate Craig. He'll debate bishops. He'll debate various religious people, but he, he gives all these conflicting reasons he won't debate Craig and uh, so he refused again and so the Christians in the UK thought remember those buses the signs on the buses there's probably no God why don't we buy a few of our own signs and put them on buses in London and they did and I want to show you says there's probably no Dawkins so stop worrying and then it says and come and enjoy a night at the Sheldonian theater and it gives the website with all the information and what they did you'll love this they set it up they had two tables uh, you know like you do at a debate one with a name tag for William Lane Craig and a microphone the other for Richard Dawkins and a name tag with his name and the microphone and they told him again they said we know you said no but we're giving you another chance he's going to argue against your beliefs he's going to refute your book whether you're there or not and we suggest you come and, and defend your deal in fact why don't you put him to shame he, maybe he's mentally ill or something <clears throat> Well, he refused to come, but Craig gave a scathing review of Doc and stuff. And you can look on YouTube and, and watch that. And it's powerful. And, you know, I probably enjoy this more than I should. But anyway, it's, I think it's a very cool deal. Let me go on to number five. <clears throat> this one says that our sense of morality points to a moral lawgiver. And I'm going to pick up the speed here. Look up here. See my hand above my head? What, I, what that represents is a moral standard. I'm just confessing this to you. I have this moral standard that I carry around day after day, all my life. And I, some days I do okay, but generally I don't live up to it. And you know what? It makes me feel really bad. And I wish I could get rid of it sometimes. And I can't. And here's what's more interesting, is you could put your hand up there too. Because you all have that, and so do all of our friends, and so does anyone who's a normal human. Why do we do this to ourselves? The answer is we don't. We didn't come up with it. We didn't set that standard. It's above us. It's woven into the fabric of what it means to be a being created in the image of a holy God. The moral law that we all carry around and are aware of and sometimes strive for and sometimes ignore but always are aware of points to the existence of a transcendent moral law giver. Powerful argument. Next one. Reason six. Now I'm shifting to a different kinds of reasons now. These next ones are going to relate to the Bible. And again, not quoting a verse but showing reasons we can trust the Bible. Reason 6 says, The Bible is a uniquely consistent religious book. I have a, a quote here I want to read you from Dr. Norman Geisler. He and uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Nix wrote a book. <clears throat> and they have a great summary of this one. If I can catch up with myself here. They said... 
you know, the book, the Bible is composed as it is of 66 books. It's not one book, as we all know, but it's 66 books written over a period of some 1,500 years by 40 authors using several different languages and containing hundreds of topics. And yet it is more than accidental or incidental that the Bible possesses an amazing unity of theme, which is Jesus Christ. And I would add more than that, an amazing unity of teaching about who God is, who humans are, that we're sinners in need of a Savior, and then about Jesus Christ. And he says, only on later reflection, both by the prophets and later generations, was it discovered that the Bible is really one book whose chapters were written by men who had no explicit knowledge of the overall structure. Their individual roles could, can be, could be compared to that of different men writing chapters of a novel for which none of them had the overall outline. Whatever unity the book has must come from somewhere beyond them. Like a symphony, each individual part of the Bible contributes to an overall unity that is orchestrated by one master. What a great description. The fact that this book written over a millennia and a half from all these different places has one message tells you there's one messenger. And this is a powerful argument for the divine nature of the Bible, or the authorship of the Bible. Next one. The Bible is a uniquely historical religious book. A lot of people who don't study the various religions will make naive statements. You know, they all kind of are the same. They all have equal claims to the truth. They all based on history or based on, you know, legitimate truth claims. Really? Have you ever studied them? I took a, a group in Chicago, a group of Christians, we had a whole bus of us, to a, on a tour of a Hindu temple. And the Hindu tour guide welcomed us, said, let me take you through the temple, but let me tell you something. One of the reasons I love my religion, he said, get this, our religion, Hinduism, our religion is so old we don't even know where it came from. I'm thinking, sign me up, man. Wow. <laughs> Who wants to sign up for something you don't even know where it came from? And you read Hindu scriptures, it's, you know, Lord Krishna dancing around lotus. And it's not like they go, this happened in such and such a year, B.C. or A.D. It's not that kind. It's more like Greek folklore or, myth, you know, mythological gods. So that one doesn't make those kinds of claims. Um, let's talk about Islam for a minute. The same day we took that tour, we went in a mosque. And the imam, by the way, we told them we were coming. We weren't raiding these places. We were just visiting politely. We wanted to see firsthand what they do and what they teach and so on. They welcomed us in. They had us sit in a semicircle uh, in the mosque. And then an imam stood in front of us and lectured us. And he was going to tell us what Islam teaches. And he kind of went over, you know, and he's talking about Islam, but he kind of delved into some areas we were pretty familiar with, including, he said, God is not divided. In other words, forget the Trinity. God is not a father. God does not have a son. Jesus is not God's son. Jesus is a prophet, but not the son of God. And God would never allow his prophet to suffer in the way you say he did as Christians. You would never allow him to die on the cross. There's a verse in the Quran that indicates that God made someone else look like Jesus and die on the cross. And most Muslims believe it was Judas. Okay? So, Jesus was not the Son of God. He did not die on the cross, and therefore the resurrection is gone too. Sorry about Easter. And he was saying this boldly. I mean, very passionately and confidently. And, you know, kind of staccato speech. And then after he was finished, he said, do you have any questions? Man, talk about your heart beating, you know. And a bunch of the people that I had brought, Christians, you know, asked various questions. But I, I had one that I felt like got to the heart of it. And I finally took a deep breath and said, I have a question. I said, here's my question. I said, I and we and Christians all around the world believe three things you just said are not true. We believe Jesus repeatedly claimed to be the Son of God. We believe he did die on the cross. In fact, that he came for that very purpose. And therefore, he, you know, he was in the grave. And then he did rise from the dead. And we base our hope on that. Now, you have, you know, they have the right to believe what they want to believe. But I, my question was, how do you know? I said, here's how we know. We know because it's based on people who walked and talked with Jesus for three years. 
and then wrote it down in historical documents, and we have copies of those documents. It's historical. This is what happened in history. I said, my question for you, sir, is do you have any historical reasons to deny these things? And then I probably should have stopped there. (laughs) I said, or do you base it on a guy 600 years later sitting in a cave talking to an angel? Which is a pretty honest way of describing where they get their beliefs. Muhammad talking to an angel. The angel says, nope, he wasn't the son of God. So I said, my question is, is it all based on the guy with the angel or do you have any historical reason? And he he glared at me and he said, I choose to believe the prophet. And then that was the end of Q&A. But the point here is, he did not even try to make a historical claim. It it is based on a a guy they think is a prophet sitting in a cave talking to an angel. And I said, I want to believe based on history. We have the history. And what we have is true. Let's go on to the next one. Oop, wrong color. Reason number eight. The Bible is a uniquely preserved work of antiquity. You probably know this, but ancient writings of all kinds, not just the New Testament, ancient writings were written, but we lose the autographs. We don't have any originals of any ancient writings. But they're written, and then if you look up here, here's a time scale. Written here, and then over here, or here, or here, we have the first copy. And most ancient writings that are considered reliable are like from there to here is like 800, 1,000, let's just say on average 1,000 years, and on average 8 or 10 copies. And, and historians say, but they're good copies. And yeah, it's 1,000 years, we only have 8, but there's good reason to trust it. We trust that document. Okay? New Testament. Written here, first copy here. Do you see that? You watch closely now. Written here, first copy here. About 30 years later. By the way, they think they found earlier copies now. I don't know if you know, but there's pretty strong belief we now have copies of the Gospel of Mark within the first century. But here, and then here, and here, and we have copies all the way through here, and yes, all the way over here too. And whereas they have a thousand year gap, we have, you know, starting with our first fragment, a 30 year gap. Whereas they have eight or 10 or 12 copies, we have 5,800 plus in Greek alone, plus 20,000 in other languages. Uh, Dr. Daniel Wallace in Dallas, an expert in these things, says we have an embarrassment of riches when it comes to the manuscript evidence to show that what we have is a reliable rendition based on all these copies. The Bible you hold in your hand, has you have good reason to be confident. It is what it claims to be. Next one. I keep pulling out the red pen here. Let's go to the next argument. Uh, next reason says archaeology shows the Bible to be a powerfully verified book. You probably know this, but over and over and over, skeptics have said, well, you know, this, this Old Testament fiction of the Hittites, there's no evidence for the Hittites. Whoops! Found some. Okay, the Bible got it right that time, but this whole idea of Jericho and marching and walls falling, that's ridiculous. Oh, oops. Found Jericho. How'd these bricks fall down like this, huh? Then, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah, that, what, you know, what is this, anti-gay literature? We don't believe in this stuff. This is, there's no, oops, found Gomorrah. What's this ash layer here? There's a six-inch layer of ashes over the city of Gomorrah. Huh, that's interesting. Uh, Pilate never tried Jesus. There's no evidence. Oops, found a plaque with Pilate's name and the date on it. And I could go on. This has been repeated thousands of times. Bottom line, don't bet against the Bible because archaeology will prove you wrong. Next one. The Bible is a uniquely honest religious book. Some people say it's wishful thinking. People just made up the stories to feel better. Yeah, like the judgment day. Uh, Yeah, like hell. Um, like, and here's another example. The, the historians have something they call the criterion of embarrassment. And what it means is when, when you study historical documents, if they include details 
that embarrass the very people that wrote them? It's probably true. Because if you're making fiction, you make yourself look good. So when you have Noah drunk in a tent and David committing adultery and Solomon doing everything he did and you have, you know, Judas betraying Jesus and Peter denying him three times and cussing the third time, it's probably true. And lots more examples could be given. That's the earmark of truth and it shows part of why we can trust the Bible. Next one. The miracles point to the prophets and apostles and especially Jesus as being who they claim to be. Let's just take Jesus. Jesus did all kinds of miracles, but have you ever noticed something? None of his critics, these people that followed him around during his entire ministry trying to catch him on something, not one of them ever denied that Jesus did a miracle. He heals a guy's withered hand. Boom, it's normal again. And they don't say, uh, that, was, that was a trick. They say, all right, you healed him, but you did it on the Sabbath day. That's a no-no, Jesus, and you should know that. Right? So they're trying to catch him on his technicality, which we say, all right, we'll talk in a minute about what days are appropriate for miracles. But let's realize you just admitted that he did a miracle. And that's the way it is throughout Scripture. Even the resurrection. They go, okay, the body's gone. Let's say this. Let's say that while the, the... Guards were sleeping. The disciples stole the body. All right. We'll get into that theory in a minute. But you've just admitted the tomb's empty and the body's gone. Miracle. Okay? And by the way, you ever thought how ridiculous that story is? If the guards were sleeping, how did they know what happened? And if they, if they woke up and saw the disciples stealing it, then they would have stopped them. So, I mean, it's a ridiculous story in the first place. Next one. Fulfilled prophecies point to the Bible as a divinely inspired book and Jesus is the unique Messiah. You probably studied this. We could go all night on prophecies. But let me give you one. Isaiah 53, the suffering Messiah. He would be led to the slaughter as a sheep. He would be pierced for our iniquities. By the way, pierced for our iniquities? Crucifixion had not been invented yet. In fact, that was 700 years before the time of Christ. A few hundred years before that, David wrote in Psalm 22 that his hands and feet would be pierced. Amazing detail. A guy in Chicago, a friend of a friend of mine, took Isaiah 53, a section of it, took out the references and the verses, just the text in a modern translation, took it to work and showed his friends, said, read this. They read it and he goes, who's it about? And they're going, duh, it's about Jesus. So he gave it to some Jewish friends. Who is this about? Jesus, of course. Who do you think wrote it? One of your guys, you know? Max Lucado? I don't know. (laughs) Close? No, not really. Isaiah wrote it. Your guy, the prophet, the Hebrew prophet, wrote it 700 years. And by the way, you just admitted it's about Jesus. It's powerful. And prophecies just give us overwhelming evidence for the truth of the Christian faith. Next one. Jesus' sinless life pointed to the fact that he's the son of God. He made big claims and he backed them up with his life. Even on his trial, he said, who of you could convict me of sin? And they were speechless. So what did they do? They paid false witnesses to make up stories because they couldn't find one moral flaw in Jesus. Now I have a little challenge for you. When you get back home... Look at your family and say, who of you could convict me of sin? (laughs) They're going to, oh man, who has a legal pad with lots of pages? You know, uh, uh, let's organize it by category. Wait wait a minute, isn't there an app I can download for the iPad that that could kind of put this in, in order for me? I mean, we are sinners. We all fall short. Jesus was not like us. And it's evidence that he was who he claimed to be. Next, next one. Jesus' resurrection. Now, this is a big arrow. I wish I had time to go into it. The evidence for the resurrection is overwhelming. William Lane Craig and other friends of mine debate skeptics on this all the time, and they win. Because history supports clearly and powerfully the reality of the resurrection of Christ. What we celebrate here in a couple weeks at Easter is based on bona fide historical fact. This is not religious fiction. 
and we can be confident of it. And there's all kinds of arguments. So I'll just tell you, you know, Lee Strobel's book, The Case for Christ, goes into those. I go into a summary of those here, but there's overwhelming evidence. Let's go on to the next one. The emergence of the church points to the truth of its message. This piggybacks on the resurrection argument. You know, lots of religions start, but they can't start the way Christianity did if they're not true. And here's why. It was in the very city where Christ had been crucified just a few weeks earlier. And Peter stands up in, in, on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. says, men of Israel, you killed the Messiah. You're in trouble. This is true. But then he rose from the dead. Now, if it was fiction, they would have gone, now we know you're drunk. You know, this, this is ridiculous. Let's get the, drive this guy out of town. Maybe we should crucify him too. You know, that would have been the reaction had they not known that this is true. By the way, if the body was still in the tomb, they would have said, hey, get the wheelbarrow. Go throw that stinking corpse in the wheelbarrow and, and let's parade it in front of these ridiculous Christians and let's stop this cult right here and now. They couldn't do any of that. And they knew they couldn't and they knew that this was true. And so what was their reaction? You're right, Peter, what must we do to be saved? And 3,000 of them come into the family. That could not have happened if it wasn't true. Next one. The changed lives of early skeptics affirm the truth of this. How do you explain Saul becoming Paul, the greatest persecutor of the church becoming the greatest missionary? One explanation. He saw the risen Jesus. And, I, you know, you can go ask psychologists or experts. There's no other reason. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. There was no gain for Paul. I mean, he persecuted lifelong, under threat all the time, stone beaten, you know, shipwrecked. And then finally, 64 AD, head chopped off. Wow, that's, man, lucrative career there, Paul. He had no reason to do it except that it was true. Next one. The willingness of the disciples to die for what they claimed affirm the truth of Christianity. Here's an important statement. No one willingly dies for what they know to be a lie. Now some people say, but Muslim terrorists die all the time for their religion. What's the difference? Here's the difference. They don't know if it's true or not. They're taught that it's true and they believe that it's true, but they're not in a position to know. They, by faith, trust that when they die killing people in a bomb or flying an airplane into a building, that they will instantly be led into paradise. And they're in for the greatest shock of eternity. But they're not in a position to know. The disciples knew whether they were telling the truth or not because they claimed to have seen, talked with, touched, and eaten with the risen Savior. No one willingly dies for what they know to be a lie. It's powerful evidence for the truth of their claims. Next one. Change minds of modern skeptics provides further support. The point is, the evidence was strong then, but here we are 2,000 years later. The evidence is overwhelming now. Smart people who look into it with an open mind end up becoming Christians. Lee Strobel spent two years hoping it wasn't true and eventually saying it would take more faith to maintain my atheism than it would to become a Christian. He ended up trusting Christ. Josh McDowell wanted to refute the resurrection. Now he's an evangelist. Dangerous thing to try to refute the resurrection. Simon Greenleaf, one of the two guys that built the Harvard Law School to what it is today, a Jewish man who wrote the, the books on evidence that the legal professions used for decades after he wrote them, was challenged by one of his students to apply his laws of evidence to the facts around the resurrection. He said, interesting challenge, I'll do it. Guess what happened? He became a messianic. Jewish person. I have his book that he wrote about the four Gospels and about the truth of Christianity. So another powerful one. Number 19 gets to you now. The testimonies of countless believers today and throughout history attest to the truth of Christianity. Apologists don't usually think of this as the most strong argument, but I think it's an important one to include, that we could get up here right now and stay up all night hearing testimonies of how God has worked in our lives, how he has redirected us, how he spoke to you perhaps during that last message and during the worship time, and how he redirects our lives, and sometimes how he, he spanks us and says, you are on the wrong track and you've got to turn around. But how do we know he's real? 
we talked to him this morning. This is powerful evidence. And I think it's worth adding. Now the last one is really important. It, it, it sounds almost tongue in cheek, but I mean it. Jesus said so. And he has the credentials to know. The guy who fulfilled prophecies, lived a sinless life, did miracles, died and rose from the dead, knew the hearts and thoughts of of men and women, lived this perfect life. This guy had the credentials all over the wall. (laughs) And he said it's true. And here's part of why it's a compelling argument. Almost everyone, have you noticed this? Almost everyone likes Jesus and wants him to be their buddy including the Muslim guy in the mosque who said he's a prophet. He's our prophet. Really? Or the Hindu that says, you know those years you guys don't know about? He was in India studying to be a guru. Really? He he didn't learn very well, did he? Um, New Agers who make him some ascended master. Or just the the guy next door who isn't into religion but thinks Jesus was a good guy, you know? Here's what I say to them. It's my simple plea. Let Jesus speak for himself. You say he's a good teacher? See what he taught. To my Muslim friends, you say he's a prophet? Let's see what he prophesied. That he's the Christ, the son of the living God. That he came to give his life as a ransom and so forth. So that's a powerful argument. Now let me conclude by saying there seems to be. Can you all see this? Do I I need to kind of turn? There it is. Oh, I guess it's on the board. Okay. Um. It seems to be forming a pattern, doesn't it? I'm guessing truth is somewhere in the middle. And by the way, I'm into tolerance. I believe in a pluralistic society where we support and fight for the rights for people to believe other things. And if someone wants to believe something up here, I will support that right. But I'll also challenge it. Not the right, but the idea. And I'll say, if you're going to believe that and have a, you know, a rational faith, something worth believing, you've got to look for your own arrows that point to that and show that it's true. And more than that, you need to refute these that go the other way. Good luck with that. Because the truth points somewhere here in the middle. And the question is, where does it point? And here's the answer. It points not just to the existence of God. That's just a part of it. It points to God who came in human flesh to give his life as a ransom for our sins. And ultimately, the truth of philosophy, the truth of science, the truth of history, the truth of archaeology and prophecy truth of good psychology, the truth of human experience, all point to the one reality, the God who loves. It ultimately points to Jesus loves me, this I know. And I just want to end by saying, you can be confident as a Christian. We we shouldn't be cocky, but we should hold our head up and say, this is true. It's not true because I believe it. I believe it because it's true. And I'm going to Proclaim it with boldness. And I'm not going to be afraid. And I'm going to equip young people so when they go on the college campus, they're not back on their heels, you know, wimpy Christians afraid of being hit with hard questions. They are bold and confident Christians. And so I want to do that in my ministry. I hope you'll do it in yours. I'll just mention one other time. Everything I just taught is in this book. And uh, we've got some books left back there. I'll be back there if you want to talk about your questions, uh, if you want to discuss it more. Barbara's back there. I guess she's having a sale on these, so don't make me take them home on the plane tomorrow. I've enjoyed being with you. God bless you and your ministries.